We are continuing from last week uh, in the epistle of Jude. So remember Jude is the half brother of Jesus along with James. And it's funny because if you remember when Jesus was walking on this earth, his brothers, his half brothers did not actually believe in him. You know, they doubted. They, you know, they were saying things to him like, you know, if you want everyone to know about you, then go show yourself and go, go to the place and, you know, let people know, let people see all these things. Because if you remember at the beginning of Jesus's ministry, he, do, he did a lot of things in secret. He did a lot of things not openly because it wasn't his time yet to, to be publicly known. Because once he was publicly known, that's when the authorities started noticing and, and the ball was rolling for him to be crucified. So, you know, they were saying things like that at the beginning, but it's interesting that Jude and James and, you know, obviously uh, Paul as well, these were people that prior to Jesus' resurrection were actually negative to his message. They did not believe in him, right? So this is one of the evidences of Jesus' resurrection that he was preaching, hey, he's the son of God, he's going to rise again from the dead. Now, if somebody was convinced Right? If somebody was convinced that this person was the son of God, even though he didn't do things like that, you could say, oh, well, they were just sort of brainwashed by Jesus and did that anyway. Right? So, you know, you have cult leaders these days, right? They'll, they'll say, oh, you know, they're the Messiah, like Jim Jones, right? Everyone, let's all drink some cordial together. So, that's, so people say, oh, you know, Jesus is a bit like that. But it's very different, you know, Jesus' resurrection. Because number one, when you have a cult leader saying he is somebody, People are just believing what he says, right? But the cult leader doesn't say, hey, I'm going to die and you're going to see me die publicly and in three days I'm going to rise again. Now, if a cult leader told you, hey, that's the proof that they're going to, to that, that they are the son of God and then they didn't do that, you'd start to doubt, right? Like if Jesus just died and he didn't come back from the dead, then people would be like, that's why they were scared. That's why they were hiding. So one of the differences with the apostles is that they actually saw Jesus rise again from the dead. Because you imagine if you're going out and preaching a message saying, hey, Jesus Christ, the son of God, died and rose again. You need to believe on him. And you saw him die and you didn't see him rise again from the dead. You know, liars make very bad martyrs. That's what they say. If you know you're lying, you're not going to die for a lie, right? But it's different to us, right? We didn't see that, right? We are going off the testimony of the apostles, right? So we believe something but we didn't see it but the difference is it's based on the apostles who did see it they actually saw it they're not just believing somebody else so that's a big difference when people say oh yeah you can just believe a cult leader but the other thing as well is there are people in the bible i know i'm going way off topic but this is interesting there are people in the bible as well that are and were anti-jesus at the time right like paul of, of saul of tarsus right he was killing christians at the time you have his brothers that didn't believe in him so the question is if at the time when he's claiming these things these people didn't believe in him then what happened to make them believe right they must have seen something and that's why there's a lot of evidence for the resurrection of jesus christ right and jude is is one of them right where he didn't believe at the time wherever jesus said a, a prophet is not without honor save in his own country and among his own kin what is he saying there He's saying you can you get honor you can get you can build yourself up and get honor among people generally the people that know you the best your family they're the ones that don't honor you right they're the people that don't respect you uh so let's let's continue so that's what jude is and remember jude is a book about evil wicked people and and the, and the spiritual war that we are in right so we are in a spiritual war we need to contend for the faith and jude here is warning us here in the last time there is going to be these evil people they're going to creep into churches they're going to be preaching lies and we have to these are the sort of people we have to engage with in order to fight back in this spiritual war so we went through verse 1 to 10 uh, last week and we're going to continue on in verse 11 where he continues to explain to us about these wicked people so let's just go straight into it verse 11 in jude he says woe unto them for they have gone in the way of cain and ran greedily after the error of balaam for reward and perished in the gain saying of Corey. so he's using three examples here to give more insight more uh, characteristics of these evil people now i want to just look briefly at these three different stories so you can get an idea of what is he talking about what is the characteristic of these people that he's talking about that these evil people in the end times and the times that we live in will also have now the first one which is cain right 
Cain, we all know who he was, right? He was a brother of Abel in the very beginning um, of the sons of Adam. You know, Adam had Abel, Cain, and Seth. Now, Cain, we know, slew his brother, but we get some more insight here in 1 John 3, because in, in Genesis, when you read the story, you don't really know what happens between Abel and Cain. You just know that they had a conflict in the field, and then uh, Cain rose up and slew his brother, and then God comes and says, hey, you know, where's your brother? And he says, am I my brother's keeper? That's where we get that phrase from. Well, in 1 John 3, we get some more insight into why Cain did what he was, that it wasn't just a spur of the moment thing, that Cain was actually a, a wicked person not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, right? So Cain was not saved, right? He was, a, he was an unbeliever, you know, he was wicked. And the Bible says he's of that wicked one, the wicked one being Satan, right? And slew his brother. And look at this, and wherefore slew he him? It's saying, why did he kill his brother? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. Now, when you read, Genesis, you don't really get that picture, right? Because you read in Genesis and it's like, I don't get like why God's so angry at Cain for offering up, you know, for the fruit of the field and Abel offered up a lamb. And then Cain, like, yeah, you know, rose up, you know, maybe they got, got, got into a, a buff and, and then he got angry and then killed his brother. You kind of think, oh, I don't really know the story, but here we know. It's because Cain was actually an evil person, right? He was actually evil and wicked. He did ungodly things. And this is why he didn't like his brother. He didn't like his brother because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. So just like today, wicked people don't like righteous people. And I'm not saying that we're righteous in our own rights, because we're all sinners as well, but it's people that are trying to do good. You know, people that, people that want to do evil, they want to sin, they don't like people trying to do good. That's why they're always trying to pull them down. You know, that's why bad friends are always trying to get you back into drinking, get you back into smoking, you know, get you back into fornicating. You know, bad influences always pull you down, right? Wicked people do that. Good people try and build you up. They, they try and help you to get away from sin, not pull you back into it. So this is what, why he's using Cain as an example here. So number one, these people are just wicked, right? They're evil, they, they're intent, and they don't like righteous people, just like Cain. He didn't like his righteous brother to the point where he killed him. What's the second example? The second example was the error of Balaam. Now, I don't know if you guys know the story of Balaam, but this happens in Numbers 22. There's a few instances where Balaam is, uh, um, is mentioned in the story. <laughs> and we'll read here from Numbers 22, because basically the story of Balaam, Balaam was, he, 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 when it says he ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward, Balaam was a prophet of God. But what happened is the king of Moab, which was an enemy of God's people, tried to hire Balaam to curse God's people, right? And when he's saying he ran after the error, they run after the error of Balaam for reward, it means they do wrong for money. They do it for greed. And that's what Balaam's problem was. Balaam did something because he wanted the money. And again, sometimes when you read through the Old Testament, you don't see this insight because the New Testament gave the apostles more insight into these stories. So we learn about things that you may not learn just from reading the Old Testament. But we can see this story here in Numbers 22 when the king of Moab tries to get Balaam to curse his people, uh, curse uh, the people of God. And it says here, And Balak sent yet again princes, more and more, and more honorable than they. Why? What's happening? Because he's sending people, the king of Moab, to Balaam, to try and convince him to, to, uh, to, to curse God's people. And he doesn't at first, right? Because he says, hey, I'm only going to do what God tells me to do. And it's interesting, because when you read the story, you don't really see the greed in the story until you read about it in the New Testament. It says, and they came to Balaam and said to him, Thus saith Balak, the son of Zippor, Let nothing, I pray thee, hinder thee from coming unto me. For I will promote thee unto very great honour, and I will do whatsoever thou sayest unto me. Come therefore, I pray thee, curse me, this people. And Balaam answered and said unto the servants of Balak, If Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. This is what's interesting about this story, because Balaam at the time is saying, hey, I'm only going to say what God says. I'm only going to do what God does. So it's like, why was God so angry with him? I think I know why. It says here, in, uh, we'll keep reading in verse 19. Now, therefore, I pray you, tarry ye also here this night, that I may know what the Lord will say unto me more. So Balak, king of Moab, is sending people to Balaam, trying to get, convince him to come and curse God's people. He eventually sends this, you know, this, these more honorable princes to come. And he says, hey, well, he says, each time, just, just wait here. I'm going to see what God says, right? 
this night. So they, they stay with him at night. It says here in verse 20, And God came unto Balaam at night and said unto him, If the men come to call thee, and I think that if there is what's key to why God got upset with him. He says, If the men come to call thee, rise up and go with them. But yet the word which I shall say unto thee, that shalt thou do. So what is God saying? So they're staying with him that night, but he's saying, hey, in the morning, if they come and call you to come go with them again, then go with them. But what you're going to say, I'm going to tell you what to say. But what happens in verse 21? Do the men come and call Balaam? No, Balaam rose up in the morning and saddled his ass and went with the princes of Moab. So what was Balaam's error, right? Balaam's error, because he was greedy, he wasn't listening to what actually God had to say, right? He was chasing money more than he was obeying the word of God. And when they say they ran greedily after the error of reward, they're basically, what the Bible's basically teaching us in Jude is that these people are greedy. They're after money. That's their primary motive, not obeying God's word. And if you know the rest of the story, this is when God gets really angry when he saddles his, his ass. I, know you, I don't have all the verses in here, but... If you remember the story, he gets on his donkey and his donkey like sees an angel of the Lord stopping him. And you remember the donkey sort of rams his legs into the side of the rock and he's saying like, you know, why are you doing this to me? He hits the donkey and then the donkey speaks. Right? And the donkey says, you know, there's, a, there's an angel here. and then Balaam sees the angel there. And it's actually the donkey seeing the angel and stopping Balaam from going, which actually saved Balaam's life because God had sent this angel to go kill him. And then, you know, then you've got uh, Shrek. So that's why, you know, if you don't understand in Shrek, where the talking donkey came from, they're actually mocking the Bible, right? Because this is actually a story in the Bible that actually happened. It's obviously miraculous, right? Where God made this donkey talk to Balaam and forbid, forbade the madness of the prophet, like the Bible says. But then you have Shrek including it with all the other fairy tale stories, right? That's why in Shrek, you remember Shrek has a, he's an ogre, right? You have all the fairy tales and you have a talking donkey. That's what they're mocking. Right? They're mocking one, a true story from the Bible in the Old Testament. Obviously a miraculous one. Now what's the last one? The last one, the errors of the ungodly. Got the, gone in the way of Cain, ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward. Right? So they are um, seeking money and, and, and material wealth more than obeying God and caring about God's word. And look at this, and perished in the gainsaying of Cory. Now, what is the gainsaying of Korah? You may not be, this is probably the most unfamiliar one of the three here um, because the name as well is very different to how it's spelled in the Old Testament because in the New Testament, it's Korah, but in the Old Testament, it's Korah. And if you know who Korah was, Korah uh, was one of the men which stood up against Moses uh, in terms of getting angry at why Moses was in charge of the people of Israel uh, and, and God had appointed to be um, a ruler over the people of Israel. And that's what it's referring to. So let's read the story in number 16. It says, Now Korah the son of Ishar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and Datham and Abiram. So he's, he's giving us here the genealogy of Korah. So Korah was a son of Kohath, and Kohath was a son of of Levi. Now, if you, you know the uh, importance of the tribe of Levi, the tribe of Levi was given the task to look after the tabernacle of God, right? And there were three sons. There was Kohath, uh, something, I can't remember, and Merari, right? So there were three sons of Levi, and each of those sons, their families were given different tasks in the tabernacle, right? And this was the, the Levitical priesthood, if you think about it. So the, the Aaron was of the tribe of Levi as well. Same with Moses. Um, so the Levites were given the work of the tabernacle, right? And they each had their different jobs. So they didn't get an inheritance of the land because what was meant to happen, the people were meant to give a tithe to the tabernacle and that would be how they would get their income and they would just work the tabernacle. Now, this was a great honor, honorable position, right? Like today in the church when people serve God, like the position I held. I have, these are honorable positions that are meant to be given to people. You know, it was given to Levi, it was a blessing to them. But see, the priesthood, the priests had to descend from Aaron, right? So Moses was, you know, the one, the prophet that led people, uh, the, led the people out of Egypt. Aaron, his older brother, he was chosen to be the priest of the tabernacle. So the priests were the ones that actually brought the blood into the holy place and sprinkled the mercy seat and interceded to God on behalf of the people. So that was an even more privileged position, right? The, the priesthood. 
and, and the sons of Aaron were the priests that were in the, the, t the tabernacle. So you can understand how that works. Aaron is the priest. He's the one that's going in and out of the Holy of Holies. And the ones, the workers of the tabernacle are the Levites. And then you have the three sons of Levi. And they don't get an inheritance in the land. The rest of Israel paid a tithe. And that's how the Levites, Levites got their, their income. So you can see here that Korah is of the sons of Levi. So he's part of the families that work in the tabernacle. But he's not a priest, right? He's not, he doesn't descend from Aaron. It says, and they rose up... <coughs> before Moses, with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. So they have influenced 50 people that are quite you know, famous in, in, in the congregation to, to dispute the position of Aaron and Moses. And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, Ye take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them, Wherefore then lift ye up? So what is the problem with Korah, Nathan, Dathan, uh, was it Dathan and Abiram? When it says they perished in the gainsaying of Korah, they have a problem with spiritual authority, right? They have a problem with the authorities that God has put in their life. There is authorities in church. There is authorities in the world, right? And God is saying here that this is the problem. They, they do not respect authority. Right? And this is what's happening here. They think that everyone can just, you know, there's, there's, no, there's no authority structure. They're saying here, you take too much upon you. What are they talking about? Too much authority, right? Too much authority upon you. Seeing all the congregation are holy. Hey, it's like in church today. It's like, hey, we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. Why, why do we need to have a bishop? Why do we have to have authority in church? No, there's a reason for authority. God has appointed authority in the church, just like he appointed authority back then. He says, every one of them, and the Lord is among them, wherefore then lift ye up. Now let me ask you, did Moses lift himself up? Did Aaron lift himself up? No, right? These were men chosen by God, right? And it's the same with bishops. Bishops don't choose themselves. They don't ordain themselves, right? They are ordained from other authority. And just like Moses, God chose Moses, right? God chose Aaron and people are expected to obey those authorities that are put over them spiritually. So same with here, Moses and Aaron, they didn't lift themselves up, right? They were appointed by God to do what they did. And this is the problem with wicked people. Wicked people do not uh, respect that authority that God has put in place. He says, wherefore then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. Here we see Dathan and Abiram, right? Because Moses and Aaron, when this, this conflict happens, he calls the people for a meeting. It says, And Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, which said, We will not come up. It says, Is it a small thing that thou hast brought us up out of the land that floweth with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness? So now they're blaming Moses, right? They're blaming Aaron why they can't go into the land um, rather than it being the wickedness of the people. It says, except thou makest thyself altogether a prince over us. So you see, that was the problem with Cory. And because of that, if you know the story, the earth, it's funny because, you know, uh, Moses, you know, cha basically challenges them and, and the earth actually opens up and they just descend into hell. God kills uh, Korah, Datham and Abiram in this way. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, a miraculous story as well. So these are the three examples here. The three examples where it says here in uh, Jude, They've gone in the way of Cain, so they're, they, they, they're wicked people and they hate righteous people. They ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward, so they do things for money. That's what motivates them. And they have perished in the gainsaying of Cory. They do not, they think they can just hold positions of authority even though God has not appointed them. This is where you get self-appointed preachers, women preachers, homosexual preachers, preachers, you know, these people are not qualified to preach. Right. And, you know, the, the Bible says that the bishop must be the husband of one wife. But nowadays you have wicked people creeping into the church, getting into these positions of authority and influencing the people of God. And this is what he is warning us about. Now, let's go on. Um, I know I spent a lot of time on, on verse 11 just because uh, I thought those stories were interesting. So go back and read those stories. Read those stories in the Old Testament. Get familiar with your Bible. And then when you read stories, uh, when you read passages like this in Jude, you'll know what he's talking about. You'll know what Jude is trying to warn us about. These are spots in your feasts of charity, 
when they feast with you, verse 12, feeding themselves without fear. So this is where he's warning. These ungodly people that are coming in these end times, they try and creep into the Christian world. Right? They try and creep into churches, like we talked about. They try and take up positions of authority. And that's what I was mentioning last week. You know, when you see you know, the homosexual minister, the female bishop that's trying to represent Christianity, this is the, what the Bible's talking about. These people that do not care about the Word of God, and yet they get into positions of authority. They influence the Church of God. So they are spots in your Feast of Charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. So they go into churches and they eat together with the people of God and they have no fear of God in them, even though they know in themselves they do not care about these things. And they're just out to do wicked things. Look at this, clouds. I, I think it's interesting here when you read through this next passage, there are four natural things that they refer to. And I think it's interesting that they all mean something spiritually. Uh, this is what I believe. It says here, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds. And I think what's interesting about clouds is clouds block out the sun, don't they? They block out sunlight. So that's why he's referring to them as clouds because clouds block the truth. Like the, like the word of God is light. Jesus Christ is light. But these wicked people, they're like clouds. They block that light. They make it hard for people to understand, hard for people to hear things. They don't want the truth known carried about of winds. What does that remind you of? Tossed to and fro, right? With every wind of doctrine. Because these wicked people, they, they don't have any principles. They don't care what they believe. They just go with whatever's popular. You know, this mo one moment they're preaching this, another moment they're preaching something else. They just want to be relevant, right? They just want to move with the crowd. And that's why they're saying they're clouds, they block the truth, and wherever the wind's blowing, that's where they go. Because they're just trying to influence, they're just trying to make money, they're just trying to build a crowd, build influence. Carried about of winds trees whose fruit withereth so it's interesting that they have fruit that they produce right if we think about what fruit is to the christian it's not only disciples but one of them is you know it's the, your followers right so they say what what we're seeing here is they are likened to trees because they also create followers they create disciples as well but what's the difference between a real tree of god and a false ungodly tree whose fruit withereth right because they're not saved without fruit twice dead what is that talking about because they're going to die physically and they're going to die spiritually plucked up by the roots raging waves so this is the third one raging waves of the sea foaming out their own shame now what do i liken this to if you think about a raging wave what does that do it causes a lot of damage doesn't it a wave that comes in you know floods kill so many people get destroyed the power of water so it's like these people, these ungodly people, they're raging waves because they do a lot of damage to the cause of Christ. But once a wave is over, what's left? It's just the, just the shame, the fornication, the greed, the, the, the wickedness that you see from them. And the last one, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Now, why are they wandering stars? See, I, what I think is, it's like when we saw in Jude, uh, I think it was in verse 4, where it says, you know, the angels which kept not their first estate. You know, they despise dominion. They don't know their place. Because if you think about a star, a star, people use it to navigate. You know, they look into the night sky. That star is always in that same spot. So if you think about stars, they're in fixed, fixed positions, aren't they? They know their place. They know their dominion. But these people, they're wandering stars. See, so they have, they, they guide people, but they guide people the wrong way because they're constantly moving and shifting, right? Wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. So that's a reference, obviously, to the eternality of hell. And Enoch also. So see, here's where in the New Testament, see, there is some revelation to the apostles and to the early followers of Jesus that is not mentioned in the Old Testament because we know who Enoch was. Enoch was the seventh from Adam and we know that he was a godly man. There's only two people in the Bible that did not die a physical death, right? It was Enoch, said he didn't die, he walked with God and God translated him. So we don't know what it means, what, you know, obviously he did right, we don't know what he did, but he walked with God and Enoch didn't die a physical death, he was just taken to heaven, he was translated. The same with Elijah. Remember, Elijah didn't die a physical death because Elijah, when he was with Elisha, right, he was taken up 
You know that song, Chariots of Fire, right? Well, that title comes from where Elijah was taken up in the whirlwind. Chariots came and took him up to heaven, right? So he didn't actually, um, he didn't actually uh, die a physical death. So it's Enoch and, 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 um, and, and Elijah. <clears throat> now you might say, because you know Jesus, and this is just an extra bonus bit, but you know, Jesus says, no man had ascended up to heaven, but the Son of Man which came down from heaven. And some people will say, well, wait a second, but Elijah ascended up to heaven, right? Because he was taken up in a whirlwind to heaven. So the answer to that is the difference is Elijah was taken up to heaven, right? The chariots came down and actually carried him up to heaven, whereas Jesus was not carried up to heaven, right? He, he ascended himself to heaven. So that's the difference. When he says, no man has ascended to heaven, it's no man has ascended to heaven through his own power, right? Elijah was taken up. Same with... Uh, Enoch, God translated him, right? But Jesus ascended himself up to heaven. So Enoch also, so here we get a glimpse into Enoch's preaching, right? Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, so seventh in genealogy, prophesied of these, saying, so Enoch was a preacher of God, saying, behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints, right? So this is talking about the end times when we return with Jesus Christ on white horses. So he is even preaching about the end times. Now, as you listen to the preaching of Enoch, think about what word sticks out. To execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they've ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So you see how Enoch, he was a righteous preacher. What was he doing? He was preaching against the ungodliness of his day, right? And also prophesying of the ungodliness to come. But when preachers do that today, when they preach against ungodliness, they're the unpopular ones. They're the mean ones. They're the people that they don't like. But in God's eyes, these are the righteous preachers. These are the preachers that are willing to tell people the truth. Now we read today in Jeremiah, remember we were reading Jeremiah 7, 8 and 9. Do you think Jeremiah was a popular preacher? Of course not. You know, he wasn't a popular preacher, but he was a righteous preacher, right? Because he preached judgment. He preached what God asked him to preach, and he preached against an ungodly nation. These are murmurers. So we get some more characteristics of these people. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts. So see, when you murmur and you're, and you're complaining, it's because you're discontent, right? Because you're desiring things that you don't have. So we don't want to be murmurers and complainers. We want to be content with the things that we have. Now, content doesn't mean that you don't desire other things. It just means if you don't get them, are you still happy? Right? So things don't make you happy. Right? Things will never make you happy. If you, if you desire things and you think, oh, if I just get that thing, or I get that bigger house, or that bigger, house, bigger car, or whatever, that nicer car, or that, that more beautiful woman, you, know, you, you think that's going to make you happy? No. You know, because things don't make you happy. You need to learn how to be grateful for the things you have, you know, and be happy with what you have. And their mouth speaketh great swelling words. So if you think about the swelling, it reminds you of the water, right? Like the waging waves of the sea. Their words do a lot of damage. They speak these great swelling words. Why are they speaking these great swelling words? Having men's persons in admiration because of advantage, right? Because they want to be admired so that they can get ahead, so they can make money off people. That's why they speak with these great words to, to build up these people that will give them a lot of money, and that's why they do that. And we see that today. We see the false teleprof, televangelist, right? You know, put your hand on the screen and send $1,000, and you know, God's going to bless you and give you health, wealth, and prosperity. Verse 17. Now he shifts focus, right? So he was talks about, hey, there's a fight. Then he talks, there's this whole exposition about these evil people and what they're like. Now he shifts focus to what we have to keep in mind, right? As believers, as people who sh ought to be in this spiritual fight. He says, but beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. How that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the Spirit. So what is he saying here? This is not the first time you're told about these people, but he's reminding us again because he's saying, hey, even when the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ were here, they told you about these people too, that there would be mockers in the last time. 
right? Mock people, mock us as people that make fun of, make fun of God, make fun of the Bible. Why are they doing it? Ultimately, it's because of their lust. It's funny when you talk to atheists, you know, you talk to atheists and you say, you know, why don't you believe in God? And you start talking about things. They realize they don't have all the answers. They don't really know. And then it comes out of their mouth, right out of their heart. Well, if God was such a God, why does he like, you know, he's such a party pooper. He doesn't let us do this. You know, it's all this suffering. It, it comes out of their mouth why they really don't want to believe in God because they don't understand how God works. And they, want to, they don't want to have somebody control, have control over them, have authority over them. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the spirit. This is why we don't want to separate up into smaller groups too much in church. When we have everyone together, everything's out in the open. Nothing's done in secret. So for us, right, what is he trying to warn us of? He's saying, hey, you need to expect spiritual opposition. There are going to be enemies out there that are going to oppose, and they are going to mock Christianity. They are going to mock what you believe. They're going to mock the Bible. And the question is, are you ready to take part in that fight when it comes to you? Are you ready to answer the mocker? Right? Are you ready to give them you know, sound doctrine, speak back to them to trip them up, you know, stab them a bit spiritually and fight back? Look at what it says here in 2 Peter 3. If you remember, he says, the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ told us about these mockers. In 2 Peter 3, Peter writes a similar thing where he warns about these scoffers that come in the last time. He says, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts. Doesn't that sound familiar? And saying, look at this. This is how they mock, right? Where is the promise of his coming? So they're saying today, is Jesus ever going to come back? Well, he hasn't come back for 2,000 years. You know, things like that. For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Right? So you can see here the scoffers, the mockers, what are they doing? They're not necessarily always just persecuting physically. Right? But they're attacking philosophically as well. They're challenging Christians to try and defend their faith. And sadly, most Christians don't even know their Bible well enough to defend their faith. Right? You don't want to have an answer you know, if you're in this spiritual fight. Like, well, that's just what my parents taught me. You know, that's just what I believe. You know, that's, you know oh, I know it doesn't all make sense, but I just, you just got to have faith. You know? No, 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 it, does, it can make sense. You just got to learn. You got to understand these things. Things can make sense. And when things start to make sense, you realize how much atheism doesn't make sense how much all these other religions don't make sense right they think they got all these answers no it's just because you, you haven't if you learn enough you realize oh wait christianity you know after you're done climbing the mountain of truth you realize the bible's been there all along you know it says here where is the promise of his coming see so they're, they're they're doubting the bible they're trying to mock the bible he says here this is interesting how this chapter ends. So if you didn't realize, I've jumped down to verse 17. So this is 3, 4. He goes into the, the wicked people as well. I didn't want to cover that. But I want to show you this. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, be, uh, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. So he's, again, see he's saying, hey, beware of these people. Beware of wickedness because you may fall from your own steadfastness. But how do you prevent yourself from falling? Look at how he finishes this chapter. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. So how are you not going to fall from your own steadfastness? There's two things you've got to grow in, right? You've got to grow in knowledge, right? If you don't know enough about Christianity, about the Lord Jesus Christ, about the Bible, you need to grow in knowledge. But not only that, because if you only grow in knowledge, then you end up being a babe who's proud, right? Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifies. So what else do you have to grow in as well? You gotta grow in grace, right? In character, in love, and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So how do you prepare for the spiritual battle? You gotta grow, right? You gotta grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I just think it's so interesting when you read 2 Peter 3, that's the flaw of that chapter. He's warning about these wicked people and he ends saying, hey, you need to grow in the faith. You need to grow in grace, grow in knowledge so you, you can be a soldier for Jesus Christ and be effective in this battle. Let's go back to Jude, last couple of verses and then we'll finish. But ye beloved, building up yourselves. So again, Jude has got the same thought, right? You need to build up yourselves. And I've underlined yourselves to remind you that you're not alone in this battle. Right? Remember, yourselves is a plural word. Word. We ought not to be alone in the battle. Sometimes you may be alone. Right? Sometimes I've had to go soul winning by myself. Right? 
But thank God I'm not the only soul winner in the world, right? There are other people that go soul winning, right? And, and we have to always remember that. We are not alone. Plus, we've got Jesus with us. Building up yourselves. So you see how this is a group effort. It's not just you are on your own to build yourself up. No, we are building up ourselves. We have to help one another grow in grace and in knowledge. Building up yourselves in your most holy faith, Christianity, right? Praying in the Holy Ghost. So this is why we pray together. It's important that we pray. Keep yourselves. See, again, remember he's addressing a group of people, right? So we have to look out for one another. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And of some have compassion, making a difference. See, it requires love. It requires compassion to make a difference in this world. It says here, others save with fear. Yeah, have you ever heard people say, oh, fear is not a good motivation, be motivated by fear? Well, the Bible says, no, others save with fear. You need to tell them about hell. You need to tell them about judgment. You need to tell them you know, that one day they will die and they need to face judgment. They need to be saved. Others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. Look at this, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. What does that mean? That means if you are worldly, you're not going to be as effective when you're trying to fight for Jesus Christ, right? If you have the love of the world in you, the love of the Father's not in you. And if the, the more love of the world you have in, the less love of God you have in you, and your love starts to grow cold. That's why we need to grow in grace, in knowledge, but we also have to grow in hatred of the things of this world, right? We grow in hatred so that we can be more effective for Jesus Christ and more committed to the cause. So sin hinders good works, right? Let's see in here, 2 Timothy 2, right? We need to hate the garment spotted by the flesh. 2 Timothy 2, look what it says here. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honour and some to dishonour. Look at this. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honour, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. See, if you want to be a useful instrument for God, you need to purge yourself of worldliness, right? You need to purge yourself of iniquity. I always explain it like this to people. Like, if you want to clean a table, right, you need to get a clean cloth. Right? Otherwise, you're just smearing all that rubbish all over the table. It's the same with God. He wants to use a vessel for his work and it, he's not going to use a vessel unto dishonor right so we need to purge ourselves from these things so that we can be used more by god right in the last two verses and this is really just a an exhortation right a, a giving glory to the lord jesus christ now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the pres presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Saviour, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. So that is to Jesus Christ. Why? Because Jesus Christ is the only wise God, our Saviour, and to him be glory. So he ends this epistle by giving glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's interesting here that he says that this only wise God, our Saviour, is the one that presents you faultless before the presence of of his glory with exceeding joy. And if we compare this to Colossians 1, you'll notice here, it's just talking about Jesus Christ, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, so you can see here that this is clearly talking about Jesus Christ, the man, right? But God was manifest in the flesh. By him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. Look, in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unpro un unreprovable in his sight. So you see here the man Christ Jesus it's talking about, and yet he's going to present us holy, unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. 
right? And that's a great, the great mystery is that God was manifest in the flesh because Jude here says that him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless is the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, but now and evermore. Why? Because God was manifest in the flesh. Jesus Christ was the only wise God. Anyway, I hope you learned something from Jude. Now when you read through Jude again, hopefully it makes more sense to you. But what is the application? Just remember, when you read through Jude, it's reminding us we are in a spiritual fight, right? We need to beware of the ungodly enemy, right? The enemy's tactics. And how are you going to prepare for that? We need to build up ourselves and our most holy faith. We've got to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Um, thank you as we, as we read through these chapters. Um, there's so much wisdom we can learn from it. Lord, help us to grow in grace and in knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, so that we can be a, a vessel, meet for the master's use, a vessel unto honor. So thank you, Lord. I pray, uh, Lord, that people will be edified and learn and, 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 and encouraged, Lord, and motivated to get in this spiritual battle and help them to not be naive about what's out there. Help them to beware lest they fall from their own steadfastness of their faith. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, uh, we give you all honor and glory for dying for us. And we thank you, Lord, that through you we have assurance of eternal life. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.